Good morning and welcome to the Perimeter Point Church Worship Experience. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Crystal Logan and I'm delighted to lead us in worship today. But first, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful, Lord, to you for yet another day where you have gifted your grace and your mercy to us. It is new and awaiting us right now, Lord. We are thankful for the breath that you breathe into our bodies, the blood that you pumped into our veins. Lord, today we cast all of our anxieties, our cares, our fears, and our burdens at your feet, Lord, because yours are light, Lord. We are just thankful that your love is boundless, so boundless, Lord, that you gave your only begotten son so that we would not die and perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus, through your sacrifice, we have salvation. We are gifted peace. We are gifted the Holy Spirit, which comforts and convicts us. And we are just eternally grateful. So today we just seek to praise your holy name, shout to the mountaintops and sing to the heavens of your grace and your mercy. Your Lord, your grace and your mercy endureth forever. We are just so grateful and so thankful, Lord. And it's all these things we pray and declare in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. church this morning, I want to encourage you to click share on whatever platform you're using right now. Most of you are using our YouTube channel, uh, but some are also on our church online software. And either way, I would really encourage you to take a moment right now and to click share. Uh, some of you will actually be using our Facebook premiere page. And I really want to encourage you, be bold in your faith, you know, share it on your Facebook page so that others can hear what you're thinking about, talking about, and just even what's on your mind and heart today. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles as we're getting ready to go forward with service today uh, to Revelation chapter 3. We've been in this book for the past several of weeks looking at love letters to the church. And the reason I've called them love letters is because Jesus has often referred to his bride, the body of Christ, Christians, followers of Christ, as his bride. And he makes sense that he would send love letters to them. So they're not always easy letters that were, were received. Um, he has some where he gives some praise to them. He has others where he gives both the good news and the bad news, like we looked at last week. And then he's got one like today, which is just a stern letter with nothing, nothing real positive in terms of what they're doing well. He just cuts to the chase and says, look, you really got to think about this and turn your life around. But he, of course offers a, a way to turn back around to him and to start living a life that he originally intended for them all along. So I want you to get ready for that. I want you to sit back. I want you to 
grab your cup of coffee, but I also want you to try to eliminate as many distractions as you can, okay? Um, be sure to share, but also invite family members within your home. We're going to join in song and singing. Uh, we'll have things that we talk about at the end of service, things that are happening in our church. But when all said and done, we feel like this is something that we offer up to God, our worship, our praise, our minds, our intellect, our, our heart. It is all a part of worship when we are gathered here together. And so avail yourself to what God wants to do in and through your life and in this time together. One, two, three. I got a serious question for you today. How are you really doing? I want to know spiritually, how are you doing? With all that is going on with COVID-19 specifically, how are you doing spiritually? I just want you to keep it real, okay? You know, are you doing good? Are you are you struggling? Or are, are you, are you let, me, let me do it this way, okay? Give me an emoji that best describes how you're feeling right now. Are you at the faithless stage or are you all the way over on the other side of the continuum, which is the on fire or fearless stage? 
Let me give you everything in between and let me tell you what I mean, okay? First of all, picture the emoji for faithless. Are you kind of like, okay, I just tuned in. Yeah, right. I, I'm really not convinced that uh, anything you're about to tell me is, is, is real. Uh, I have a whole lot of questions about faith. I'm doubting my faith right now. And I'm, to be honest with you, kind of frustrated with the whole faith thing because there's a lot of stuff I'm struggling with. Is that the emoji that just best pertains? Or could you even be in the genuine, I just don't know phase? You're, you don't have that faith just yet, but you're certainly willing and open to see what God might say to you today. And then there's the, the fearful. Anybody fearful and a tad bit anxious today with what they've got going on? Uh, lost jobs, loved ones who are sick, you're serving on the front lines, you're ex potentially exposing yourself. I mean, all those kind of things. Um, or do you find yourself anxious and fearful or even downright scared with what's happening in our world and happening in your situation? Well, another one is, are you, are you fake today? <laughs> oh, come on, you know people, including ourselves sometimes, inside we could be a wreck and we ask you how you're doing. Oh, I'm great. All's well. Thanks for asking. It's really going great. But you know you're struggling. So is there a little bit of a facade going on right now? Are we being a little bit fake? There's an emoji for that, actually. Uh, there's one that is the big, wide-eyed, bright, happy-go-lucky. And then there's the uh, uh, you're really not being real face, as you see there on the screen. Then there's the one who's on fumes. You may not be faithless and you may not be fearful, but with everything going on, you are on fumes. You are emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. Could it be though, as a, as a, as a, as a Christian and as a part of your church, whether it's Permit or Point or somewhere else, you find yourself in the friendly stage. You're caring for each other. You're checking on people. You know, you're making sure everybody's okay and your family and your people you care about. Um, that's good, you know, you're showing love for one another and care for one another. Um, but here it is, we're going to be talking about a letter to the church. So what about this category? Can you say that you've been faithful? Are you being faithful to what God has gifted you to do? Are you being faithful to what he's called you to do? Are you being faithful to the church that you're a part of? Are you being faithful in just doing what he's asked of you to do on a regular basis? And then you know, there's that faithfulness part, but then there is also, even in this continuum, you know, you can be faithful, but not feel that passion for doing what you want to do, that fire, uh, you know, what, what, what is driving you to do the things that you're doing, and are you doing it with that same vitality that you once had? So tell me, I, I wonder if I can get some audience participation. Perimeter Point Church, help me on this. Put an emoji up if you're willing to keep it real. Put an emoji up that expresses how you're feeling right now, not yesterday, not a week from now. How do you feel spiritually in the midst of the coronavirus right now? Well, you know, I had to do that because these letters to the church, the seven letters that I've started talking about four weeks ago, you could see people that were operating at every place within that continuum in, that, in those churches, okay? We talked about a church called the church at Ephesus, and I called them the loveless church, because while they, you know, they followed the scripture, they had sound doctrine, everything they were doing, while it might have been good, it wasn't driven by the right motive. They had lost their first love. They were the loveless. In other words, in our context, they could have been friendly, but they weren't on fire. They weren't driven behind what they were doing. But then there's also the Smyrna church, which I called the long-suffering church. They were fearless, <laughs> And Jesus was basically saying to them, just keep going, because they were going to be persecuted. They, some were going to be killed. He said, you all, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to help you endure. You're going to make it to the end. They were fearless. But then we talked about two churches last week, the church at Pergamum, which I called the lawless church, and the church at Thyatira, which I called the lustful church. Both of these churches, actually, he commended them for being faithful in their service, um, they, were, they, were, they were doing good work. Some of them were even risking their lives for their faith. But you know what? Even in those works, they were far from God in their lifestyle. They were following the lawlessness of the culture, and they were lustful in dealing with sexual sin and other forms of immorality. And then today, we're going to talk about the church at Sardis, which covers at least three of the emojis this morning. One group, the primary group he addresses, is the faithless. Then he talks to a group that is on fumes, 
And then he talks about, and I think gives us all the potential to be the ones that are not just the few, but are the many that are on fire for him. I wonder where you want to be today. I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to be in status quo living. I want to be in that living of, of, of true destiny, purpose, and, 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 and God's favor walking with me each and every day. And sometimes I need a word like this to shake me up and get me back in in line where God wants me to be. So let's let's jump right in. You know, this church at Sardis, you can learn a lot about the content of this letter if you understand a little bit about Sardis and where it was. And this particular church, Sardis, was about 50 miles uh, northeast of Ephesus. You've heard the saying, all roads lead to Rome. Well, the same could be said about Lydia, the kingdom in which Sardis was the capital. Uh, Sardis was the capital city, but it was also where this church was. Uh, Sardis sat about 1,500 feet above sea level, and as a result, it was argued that uh, you know it couldn't be penetrated by enemy forces. Um, uh, it was known for its military might, this city. Uh, the city was stationed on a mountain. History tells us that they were infiltrated not once but twice during the night. And one could argue the reason they did was because they fell asleep at the wheel. They got complacent. Um, it's one, one scholar says the citadel, which is the fortress, typically at the high point of the city. The citadel at Sardis had been captured each time because sentries had failed to do their jobs faithfully. It, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when Jesus told his couple of disciples to go with him there in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, uh, they fell asleep at the wheel and Jesus was, was left there, you know, handling everything by himself. And he was about to go and suffer to the point of death and no one was there with him. Sardis was prospering as a city. It had become comfortable. It had become complacent. It had even become cocky in the fact that it thought nothing could defeat it. But at the end of the day, it was no different than what that church had become. It had become a church. It had become a city that was not as significant and making its mark like it had at one time before. Let's get started on the letter to the church at Sardis. It says, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, I've told you in the past with the letters, you always need to be mindful about how these letters open up. Remember, Jesus instructed John to write these letters, and every opening, Jesus referred to a different aspect of who he was, a different name for himself, because he was going to bring stuff up related to that aspect of his character. And so he says that he is uh, the one who holds the seven spirits. Now, uh, from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, where it's prophesied as, of Jesus as a branch, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. And actually, there's seven descriptions of this Spirit resting upon the branch, Jesus, that is prophesied in Isaiah, that could also speak of the seven spirits of God, which we know to be the fullness of the Spirit, if we look at other texts. texts. Look at what it says. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear or the reverence of God, the Spirit of God. The sevenfold spirit of God was upon him. But not only that, it says that the seven stars, it speaks of the leaders of the church that likewise are held in his hand. Each of the letters were sent out uh, by a leader, the pastor, an elder. One of the leaders of the church was responsible for taking this letter along with the entire prophecy of Revelation back to their particular church. Now, here's what it says. In the B clause of verse 1, it says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. He basically cuts to the chase, unlike any other letter. He doesn't talk about how they're struggling. He doesn't challenge them for following idols or not following false doctrine. He's not talking about deeds here or anything at this point. He's basically saying, you're dead. You're lifeless. I mean, you... We could go and look up the definition of dead, and I think 100 times out of 100, dead means dead. 
But again, I was talking about it with you earlier from a spiritual sense. How are you doing on this? Are you faithless or are you, are you on fire? Here's what was going on with this spiritually dead church. They were inactive with respect to doing anything. They were destitute of force or power. They were inactive. They were, they, they were destitute of any life that recognizes and is devoted to God. He's saying at this point, church, you are dead. What remained in this once alive and thriving church, for the most part, was spiritually dead. It was filled with unbelievers. It was filled with people that were stuck on ritual. People were making zero difference in their communities for advancing the cause of Christ. They were Christians in name only. So a term we use now, nominal Christians. You know, there's a poem that can describe what this church was like and what thousands of churches around the world are like. You see, in one case, one example, there's many different ways to look at it, but huge, beautiful cathedrals that took years and years and uh, resources and people to build huge cathedrals with many pews and just incredible what these what these cathedrals, majestic works of art and and that were once alive, where there was power going forth from that church, not just what was happening in the structure or anything happening in the building itself, but the it was alive. And now so many that are that are more like this. The poet says, outwardly splendid as of old, inwardly lifeless, dead and cold, her force and fire all spent and gone, like the dead moon, she still shines on. They had an appearance. They had a reputation for being alive, but they were dead. You know, there's another type of church that appears or has a reputation of being alive, but is actually dead for the most part as well. I wonder if you're familiar with any of these. They have large crowds and a lot of shouting. That's good. Praising God and having energy and excitement is good. But are they really alive and committed? Are they committed Christ followers or is there, are they, as one author puts it, Christaholics and not disciples at all? Disciples are cross bearers. They seek Christ. Christaholics seek happiness. Disciples dare to discipline themselves and the demands they place on themselves leave them enjoying the happiness of their spiritual growth. Christaholics are escapists looking for a shortcut to nirvana. Like drug addicts, they are trying to bomb out of their depressing world. Well, whatever category of dead you may find yourself in at this part of the message, he says to you and I in Revelation 3 and 2, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. If I was here in person, I sure missed meeting with my church in person. Maybe what I could have done, I don't know how, if it had gone over too well, if I had a big bucket of water and I just grabbed it and just flew it all over the entire church. It, we're small enough to probably be able to do that at this point. Just whoosh, water all over. <laughs> Everybody got hit, had no idea it was coming. As extreme as that wake-up call would have been and probably walking out of the church never to come again. Think of how you would respond if something like that happened in a church. Multiply that by a thousand and that's the type of attention Jesus is trying to get somebody on this call to, to look at. Somebody on this, on this screen right now, splash some water on your face. Multiply times a million and that's what he's trying to get your attention about in terms of your life. Is it faithless? Is it fake, as we're going to get into more here? Is it friendly? Yeah, you're good. You're connecting with people. But is it faithful? Are you, are you doing what you're called to do? Is God leading you each day? And, and are you on fire? Is it driven by your heart and love and devotion for Christ? Whatever it is, wherever you're at. If you need to go get a bucket of water, you can pour it on yourself. Wake up! That's what God is saying to some of us here this morning. All right, it says, uh, be on your guard, 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, and stay awake. 
Your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion sneaking around to find someone to attack. You need to be aware. You, you are probably operating on a false sense of security here. They still had, you know, this beautiful building and people driving by, though they didn't see anything really that was going on there. They had a, uh, an impression that this was a significant organization, significant church, making a difference. But here's the thing. They were lulled to sleep by the culture. They had got caught up on the cares of the world and the cravings of the flesh, so much so that their church services were dead. There was no passion for the word. There was no, you know, seeking after with, with, with dedication and zeal to see more of the presence of God. There was no power in that church. It's, again, why did he open the letter with the one who holds the seven spirits, the fullness of the spirit of God? Because the church was dead. The presence and the power of God, just like Elvis, had left the building. So here's the thing. If you lose the power of God in your church, if you have an opportunity to go to a church that is on fire for Christ, passionate for the Lord, filled with his spirit, people who are striving to be faithful, people who are, who are fearless for the gospel, people who are on fire for God or who are at least trying to do what this message is challenging each of us to do, to chase after God, move up the emoji continuum, if you will, and get more focused and excited and passionate and dedicated to the work of God, then you may consider another place. And I've, I, I'm, I'm asking this question for any type of church you're in. What type of part of church are you a part of? Is it alive or dead? Is it alive or hanging on by a thread? Or is it positioned to thrive and forge ahead? I mean, I got to ask the thing about Perimeter Point. I, my, this keeps me up at night. Are, are we a church that's truly cultivating life, making disciples, causing people to hunger after more of God? Or are we keeping the status quo? In fact, now that we're in these uh, quarantine stages, have we gotten so comfortable that we're not even really connecting that much anymore? That's something that I've experienced a bit and observed, and it, it grieves me. It burdens my heart. Because a church alive is not only worth the drive, but a church alive is a church that you would continue to want to be a part of. Whether you're online or in person, you have human beings that are part of your family that God wants to cultivate a growing, thriving ministry and worship experience together. In fact, I, I skipped over this verse, but here it is. You know, we are the human body, 1 Corinthians 12 and 2 says, has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. See, people need you when you're on fire, but they also need you when you are feeling faithless or on fumes because sometimes when you are on fumes a person that is on fire lifts you up right but sometimes when you're on fumes somebody else who's on fumes feels the spirit come upon them to to look beyond what they're dealing with and allow God to out of our weakness be strong in him to actually minister to somebody else while we're going through our struggle. I'm trying to say that whatever place in the continuum, you got to show up. <laughs> but God is saying, you know what? For some of you it's it's past the point of no return here. You're dead. You were you know what? In fact, it's questionable whether you were even ever a follower because how many of you know that if you are in Christ, the Bible talks about you being a whole new creation. Old has, has passed away. All things have become new. You don't act exactly the same <laughs> as when you were before Christ. Your life changes. Your priorities change. Your pursuit changes. I'm not saying you're always on fire, hence the continuum. But what I am saying is there's always something that's kind of reeling you back in and trying to pull you up higher to get back to what he's always wanted for you all along, which is a close, vibrant, loving relationship on a day-by-day -day with him.
here's the five things that God is impressing upon us in this text to do. It says, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. The five things that he's trying to get our attention toward this morning is to, number one, wake up. <laughs> and we know that uh, the, the bucket of water is what I was getting at. This is really God shaking somebody up this morning. Wake up. He's, I'm going to talk about later. He's, he will come as a thief when we're not expecting it. I, I, I want, I, I'm now more than ever with everything going on with this coronavirus and the world we're in right now. Now more than ever, I have a, a sensitivity and awareness that God is not only in control, but God will return. Listen to what I'm saying here. Wake up. God is trying to shine some light on our deeds. He's, he's saying they're incomplete. Listen, he wants us to be in the light and he wants us to wake up. Ephesians 5, 13 and 14 says, But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He, not to, he wants us to wake up uh, he wants to allow the light of Christ. He wants us to allow it to shine on us. But then he says, strengthen what remains. We're going to find out there are some that were still there on fumes, but they were still there and they were still faithful to a degree. He says, get back to the mission. Strengthen what remains. Get back to loving your neighbor. Get back to helping others. Get back to being a disciple. Get back to leading. Get back to studying to show yourself approved. Get back to the truth of God's word. Get back to, you know, just the, 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 the song. What is it? Andre T Crouch, take me back to when I first believed, you know, take me back to when I had this passion and revive that in me again. But then he says, not only wake up and strengthen what remains, but he basically says, finish what you started. He says, I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. What unfinished work does he have for you to complete? And it's all in the context of a church. So what role in the church is missing your gift, is missing your vital piece, is missing what you had been sent to that church to do in the first place? He says there are some deeds in your life that are unfinished, and it is causing our church to suffer. Remember, uh, if, if, if you, uh, the eye can't say, I don't need the, the hand and the hand can't say, I don't need the foot. You know, when, when God speaks of uh, the body as the body of Christ, but a local church is like the body. And if any of those things aren't in position, how it suffers, how it limps along. Well, he says, your deeds are unfinished in the sight of God. We need you to come back. We need you to get in position. Remember what you signed on for is the next thing. Remember what you have seen and heard, Jesus says in this letter. He says, remember, you didn't sign up for just Christaholicism. No, you signed up for discipleship. You signed up to sacrifice. You signed up in the midst of coronavirus to still give yourself away. People in my church have been hearing me say this almost every day in our 7.14 a.m. and p.m. prayer calls. If you can use anybody, use me. And I've been saying that not when I always felt like it. <laughs> not when I always had everything worked out with my bank account. Not when everything was going great with Doris or with the kids. No, I've been saying it regardless. In faith, if you can use anyone, I've signed on for the real thing. So if you can use anybody... Use me. He says, at the end of the day, not only remember what you signed up for, but repent. You want that, that, that spiritual vitality again, that joy again. You want that sense of, of fulfillment. You want that, that lack of anxiety and you want peace to return, even though maybe situation is still, the situation is still in process. You want that return. Repent and receive from the Spirit of, again. Repent of sin, repent of complacency, repent of 
the things that have pulled you away. And then guess what? If you want to be filled with the Spirit, turn from sin, ask to be filled. If an earthly father desires to give good gifts to his children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give the gift to them that ask? If you walk by faith, repenting of your sin, asking to be filled, march forward. You are filled with the Spirit. You are walking in the Spirit to the degree which you have confessed any known sin, repented of those sins, asked to be filled, and are walking forward in faith, full of the Spirit. That's how it works. As a child of God, the Spirit never leaves. It's just how much room in our heart do we give Him on any given day, both in practical sense, but also in faith. By faith, I'm forgiven. By faith, I turn from my sin and I'm walking in Him. By faith, I ask God that you fill me. And by faith, I'm walking in the authority and power of God right now. That's what God is looking for some of us to do is to repent. And then as we repent, as we see revival, because not just one, but a church is turning to him and crying out to him and seeking him, then we get to what he's saying, which is, you know, a church that can be revived. I want you to take a look at this clip. An Ohio man is alive after he was shocked 34 times to stabilize his failing heart. Now he's sharing his near-death experience with others. Frank Briggs says he felt pain in his chest while he was at home back in June. He says his wife called 911 and en route to the hospital. Briggs had a heart attack in the ambulance. Doctors say it usually only takes one shock to get your heart rhythm to normalize, but Briggs' heart wouldn't. He was shocked 33 more times before his heart was stable enough for doctors to open him up and fix the blocked artery months later. Briggs is alive and joking. He says he doesn't feel any worse than before the heart attack. Katie Johnston, CBS Detroit. Can you believe that he was shocked 34 times? <laughs> Once in the ambulance, and I guess 33 more times in the hospital? I mean, gosh, you'd think one or two times. Uh, the doctor would be like, me. I've seen it, in the, I guess, three or four times. But then you watch ER and stuff, and they're still shocking because somebody, the doctor doesn't want to quit, but it's been three hours of shocking. Well, 34 times, I mean, my goodness. But he got to a point where he could have uh, the surgery to unblock his arteries. And let me ask you this this morning. What is it that's blocking you from being spiritually alive and thriving again? What has you listening to this message right now? either annoyed or also honest with yourself and on life support. And that's why you're annoyed. But if you made it this far, I commend you. <laughs> because clearly if there's that, then there is still uh, the desire to, to come back to life and be full of faith. Now here's what I need you to know, just like that 34 shocks, we have a great physician who will come back not just 34 times, but time and time again to get your heart jumped again and to a place where he can do that spiritual CPR and surgery to get you not just alive, but I've discovered sometimes from the worst wilderness in my life, stronger and more spiritually alive than I've ever been before. So take heart. Whatever you're feeling, dry, dead, frustrated, angry, discouraged, despondent, I don't care what it is, if he's speaking to you, he gets you back in when you're ready to turn by his grace. He's pulled you in and he starts to restore you and to get you back on the path. But here's the thing. We've talked about fakers. You look like you have it going on and you're spiritual and you're doing all these things. But we've also talked about those who are on fumes that need to wake up. Both of those camps need to. We've got a group that's just holding on and Jesus is encouraging them. You know, you got to you got to strengthen what remains. There's one more group in this text that all of us can become. It says, Revelation 3 and 4, Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. There are different people listening on here. But those, as opposed to those who will ignore the words that are being said here, Maybe already turned off. <laughs> but even those listening right now that will oppose some of these tough words that Jesus has given us through this letter and will continue to pollute and stain and contaminate and even defile uh, 
their clothes, as it speaks of soiling their clothes, there are those, Jesus says, who will walk with me. They will walk with me in the light. We will walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with him. And the blood of Jesus will forgive us of all of our sins. We'll be with him and walk with him. But then it also says that, uh, he says that you'll be dressed in white. You'll be dressed. That, that phrase, dressed in white, is a picture of redemption. Revelation 7 and 14 talks about those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He says there are those in this church that are worthy. There are those who will be victorious. There are those in verse 5 who, he says, will be conquerors. And, and he says um, they will never have their name blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. And, and, and their name I will never deny before my father. That is good news. Now, here's, here's the thing is that some might say, wait a second, you just said they won't have their name removed out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Some people have made theologies on, you can write it and take it out, you know, that, that God has an eraser with this Lamb's Book of Life. No, there's nothing in here in these statements that talks about the potential for it being removed what they're emphatically saying is that those who are worthy and those who endure, those who've been redeemed, and remember, the redemption comes not by any works, but it comes through the blood of the Lamb. Those who are worthy in their faith and trust and surrender to Christ. He says, I will never blot you out. That word never is what we're really focusing on. There's no chance. Never. It's the strongest negative in the Greek language. It should be translated, I will never, ever, under any circumstances, blot out your name from the book of life. What a reassurance today. There's always my grace and my love and my mercy to bring you from faithless and on fumes back to faithful and on fire and fearless for him. Are we sincere or is this thing you know, are we really just faking the funk? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I heard that word sincere one time. Uh, you know, it could be a folklore, but I've heard it actually more than once that that word sincere is from two Latin words that means without wax. Uh, and back in the, you know, hundreds of years ago, back historically, people would sell uh, pieces of pottery and they would put... Uh, wax on them in some cases to cover up the cracks of the pottery and uh, that wax uh, at some point whether the heat melted it or too much water going in the pot eventually the wax would crack so people were selling these pots that looked like they were in great condition and uh, ready to be used but they'd buy them and they'd take them home and it was just a matter of time before they were what they were cracked and marred and the wax melted away and they became unuseful again. Those are the type of people that Jesus is writing in this letter with. You are not sincere. You're putting up this picture that, you know, I'm, I'm what I say I am as, as whatever, fill in the blank. I'm committed, a follower of Jesus. I'm a committed, you know, Christian. I'm committed to my church, as it's talking about here, I'm committed to my family, all these things. Okay, here it is. I'm 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 everything my Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and Marco Polo and everything pictures me to be. No, <laughs> the wax is going to melt. <laughs> but then there was another pot back then that was sincere. It was without wax. And they would even put a sign above those those pots sincere, without wax. So can we just be honest with ourselves? Where do we find ourselves today? Are we putting up a front? Are we barely hanging on by fumes? Or are we sincere? The other option is, he says, be alert because you don't know when I'm coming. He says, I will come like a thief, verse 5 says, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. If you've heard nothing else in this entire message to ignite in you a passion 
to move along this continuum, to give your life to Christ, to rededicate your life to Christ, to connect and be faithful in your service to Christ through the local church. He is coming back. And will we be ready when he comes? Let's pray. Well, God, I have been faithful to the assignment that you've given. The results are now in your hands. I pray for every person that, you know, has heard this message at different places in their lives, different struggles they're facing, different, you know, good seasons that they're in. They're all at different places and we're all being challenged in this message in different ways. But I'm praying, Lord God, that you would fuel a desire within each of us to draw closer to you in this day, that we would take one step, one decisive action as a result of hearing this message. Before we even tune off, you would lay something on each of our hearts that we must do, that we want to do, because this message has compelled us. This message has prompted us one thing that we can do. Could be for some to give their life to Christ. Could be for others to rededicate, others to connect with the church. It could be there's someone they need to call to forgive. It could be there's there's a, a, a daily devotion they've got to start reading again. They've got to carve out some time early in the morning. It could be they got to get on the prayer call. It could be they need to to help others incur, in, in, with their encouragement and their gift of preaching, of teaching, of 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 praying, of of singing, of caring for one another, of giving, of whatever it is, whatever that one step is, Lord God. We want to get to that point where we are alive, vitally alive in you again. Thank you for what you're doing in the hearts of all the people here today. In Jesus' name, amen.
charge today, uh, missing baseball season. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> but I got to talking about my favorite colors with one of my sons this week, and I told him it used to be blue, but now it's orange and black. And uh, for obvious reasons, as you'll see in this picture. Now, that picture, I used to have hair. I was the coolest guy, man. I was a pitcher, and I uh, couldn't hit worth a darn. I wish they'd have had me on the mound, but you know, that picture uh, is a throwback, right? And uh, yeah, I always look back at some of those pictures, think of even the clothes I used to wear, think of the things I wanted so much back then, uh, you know, saving up for things. Um, in fact, one time I was, I was telling uh, Jacob too the other day how I had one of the first Macintosh computers. It was the Macintosh SE30. It had a 40 megabyte hard drive which I'm not even sure one picture on a phone is, is less than 40 megabytes these days. It also, uh, it had a dot matrix printer. It was impressive. I, I had that in my college dorm and I was so thrilled about that, right? And then of course, just so many other things that we wanna have in this life. You know, you get the next best thing, next best pair of shoes, whatever it is, you know, and, and we want it and, and then we get it, but it doesn't take long before we don't really need it anymore or really, you know, it gets replaced so easily. And, you know, whether it's shoes or phone, whatever, um, every single thing that we acquire materially, there's you nine times out of 10, unless it's something sentimental or connected to us personally, it's eventually gonna become outdated and in a closet or somewhere, or even in a, in a landfill somewhere. But then, you know, Jesus tells us this, when it comes to things and stuff, he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. You know, Jesus affirms that everything we own, every material item that we long for, he says, basically, it's going to fade away. It's it, a style is going to, it's going to get out of style. Now those glasses I was wearing, they're still, they, they endure, but no, he's saying basically all of the different things that we get, you know, they're passing away, he says, but the things that really matter, you ought to store those treasures up in heaven. So today, even as we uh, impress upon you to pray about giving and giving cheerfully to the work that God is doing in this ministry, it's easy for us to think that, you know, what I'm about to give, it's going to be gone forever. And I, I don't even know if I can afford to do it. But here's the thing, all the stuff that we've purchased, yeah, that money goes away into a bottomless pit, pit. But the money that we give toward the work of the kingdom, it says it is stored up in heaven and it will last forever. And so just reflect upon those things as, as you consider giving to this church today. There are four different ways that you can give. You'll see that popping up on the screen. I want to encourage you to do it even now, you know, because, you know, when, when we're at the church, it's easy to see the bucket get passed and you know, some people have been less inclined. In fact, churches, their giving in a lot of cases is dropping substantially because people are less inclined to take the time to set up a giving account or to go through the, the process. But uh, it's easy once you set it up, either a text giving or, um, you know, uh, on Simple Give, you can set up an account and then it's so much as just entering a number and texting that number. And then those of you that have Cash App, we've even set that up, which is a very simple way to give as well. So I encourage you to do that. And as you're doing that even now, let me just also share a few announcements. We just got underway with our Thursday Night Life group, Living Victoriously in Difficult Times. And again, there's still an opportunity for you to join this. And I hope that when you hear the word, uh, these hard words the last couple of weeks, that it's impressing upon your heart, you know, um, that's an important hour for me to, to, to get to, and I hope you'll do that. Uh, and I can give you more information. You can message us on the screen. Hit that Connect With Us link. Then also, we still have personal prayer requests on our Facebook page. You can click Send Message on a video of either myself or my son Josh, and literally you will get personal prayers, audio prayers from me for every single prayer request that gets submitted. I also want to encourage you to become a part of our regular life of the church that we do through GroupMe. It is a group chat app where every day, you know, we're checking in with each other when we can, when our schedules permit, and we're encouraging each other, doing the prayer call reminders, checking on each other, 
uh, giving you updates on the church. You'll, you'll want to get the GroupMe app if one of the steps you're trying to take is to get closer to this church and connect it with our family. And then uh, that's it. I mean, we just thank God for each of you joining us here today. You can still click share. Uh, you can still get your kids connected online with our Church Online for Kids. We've got grade specific uh, Sunday gatherings for them as well. But let me pray God's blessing on your life and can't wait to see you next weekend, okay, and throughout the week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord bless your down sitting and your uprising. May he be gracious upon you and grant you peace. And may you just go forth this week with a great source of strength and comfort and joy, knowing that God is faithful to pull you out of any uh, life of discouragement, distance from him, or even drudgery or despair that you're facing because of everything that's going on. God is faithful, and he will see you through this week. In Jesus' name, amen.